Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the anatomy and physiology of the shoulder, specifically the muscles of the shoulder and the movements that they facilitate. But before we go into the actual shoulder joint and shoulder girdle, we need to make sure we understand something that's very unique about the shoulder in the human body. So each part of the upper body generally has a lower body counterpart. For example, the triceps in the upper body perform basically the same function as the quadriceps in the lower body. It's just that one extends the elbow, the other extends the knee. However, in terms of the shoulder joint itself, it's much more mobile than the hip joint. So the scapula associated with the shoulder are not fused together. Both scapula are actually two separate bones. In fact, if you actually move your arm in any direction, you should be able to feel your scapula moving up, down, left, or right, or some combination. The equivalent bones in the lower body are actually those of the pelvis. But the pelvis is not two separate bones. It develops as two separate bones, but they later fuse. Each half of the pelvis is the left and right os coxae. And these two bones eventually fuse, mainly at the pubic symphysis. And so because they're fused, we do not have independent movements of the pelvis, or each half of the pelvis, when we move the hip joint. So when we talk about the shoulder joint, we have to talk about two separate regions. One is the shoulder joint itself. This is going to be also called the glenohumeral joint. And this is coming from the fact that it's going to produce movements of the humerus, the last half of the word, and it talks about the joint that the humerus connects with the glenoid fossa. Okay? That's actually in the scapula itself. And the glenohumeral joint, or shoulder joint itself, is going to produce movements of the humerus. So when we typically think about movements of the arm, which are going to be shoulder abduction or adduction, such as when we do a jumping jack, or shoulder flexion and extension, these are typically what we think about of shoulder joint movements. However, we really can't have any shoulder joint movements without a corresponding shoulder girdle movements. Shoulder girdle is not the shoulder joint. It's a bunch of muscles that are associated with the shoulder, but these muscles do not actually move the humerus. Instead, they're going to produce movements of both of the scapula. Okay? So if you move your left arm, you're going to have movements of the left scapula. And the same thing will occur on the right side as well. And these movements of the scapula have to occur at the same time or concomitantly with each shoulder joint movement. So they have to occur together. And all in all, the shoulder girdle is going to basically be doing two major functions. One, it's going to stabilize the shoulder joint, and two, move the scapula. And like I said, with each movement of the humerus, which is going to be the shoulder joint, you have to have a corresponding movement of the scapula. In terms of stabilizing the shoulder joint, the shoulder girdle muscles kind of act like the packing peanuts that you have in a box. If you just had a box and you tried to ship a piece of glassware in it without any packing peanuts, you could move the box side to side and the piece of glass would move all around the box and probably eventually break. So basically the shoulder girdle muscles kind of act like packing peanuts and they stuff that piece of glassware in there so that it doesn't move and stabilizes it. So those are the two major things that you need to have associated with the shoulder girdle. And we're actually going to talk about the shoulder girdle muscles first and then in the, some uh, videos later, we'll talk about the shoulder joint. So we're going to dive right into the shoulder girdle. So there are six major movements of the shoulder girdle. And like I said, they each produce movements of the scapula. Out of these, four of the movements, which are elevation, depression, retraction, and protraction, these four movements are going to be gliding movements. So instead of having just rotation, the scapula is going to move either up, down, toward the midline, or away from the midline. So let's talk about these. This first kind over here is called scapular elevation. What's going to happen here is the scapula just glide upwards. Okay? We'll actually see this movement, in especially when people perform shrugs. Or when you shrug your shoulders upward, the scapula move upward. Depression is the opposite. So in scapular depression, the scapula actually move downwards. And as we'll see later on, 
we actually have a lot more range of motion and elevation than we do in scapular depression. And these two movements are going to be opposites of one another. There's two other major movements we're going to talk about, and those are adduction or retraction, and then abduction or protraction. So in adduction with two Ds, we know that adduction generally means moving toward the midline of the body. When we do shoulder adduction, that means we're bringing the humerus back down towards the midline of the body, such as in the downward phase of a jumping jack. In terms of the scapula, however, this is also called retraction, and this is usually the term I will use. If we think of something retracting, we mean it's like coming back towards you. So if you have a cat that's retracting its claws, it's bringing its claws back into its paw, so to speak. So when you have scapular retraction, these scapula are moving toward the midline of the body. We'll see that this movement is more associated with shoulder extension. The other major one we're going to talk about is scapular protraction. This is the opposite movement of retraction. In protraction, the scapula move away from the midline of the body, so they move more laterally. This is also called scapular abduction, and abduction we know with a B means you're moving away from the midline of the body. We would see a, mo a movement like this of the scapula when the arms tend to move in front of the body. So if we were throwing a punch in front of our body or we were doing the bench press where we could just say shoulder flexion, we would see more scapular abduction or scapular protraction. We won't talk about upward rotation or downward rotation that much in, in this series of videos, but essentially upward rotation is closely associated with shoulder abduction, such as the upward phase of a jumping jack whereas downward rotation of the scapula is going to be associated with shoulder adduction or the downward phase of a jumping jack. Like I said, we're going to focus on these first four right here. The first topic we're going to discuss is scapular protraction. So I'm going to be using this figure a lot in this, these next few videos. Here's a, a view of the scapula. It's actually going to be the same thing right here. And going in the rightwards direction of the scapula, going to the right, that would be scapular protraction because it would be a moving away from this midline. And what we can see is that there's two major muscles that are going to be involved in this. Those are the serratus anterior, which most people would consider the more important one, then also the pectoralis minor. Okay. Now, the scapular protraction would occur usually when you're bringing your arm, or humerus I should say, in front of the frontal plane, so in the direction in front of the frontal plane. This type of motion would be seen in a bench press or when you're throwing a punch in front of your body, anything that brings your arm really in front of your body. Okay? That's going to involve shoulder flexion, but also in terms of the scapula, it'll utilize scapular protraction. Now if we look at these two muscles right here, what we see is that the pectoralis minor is going to originate on the anterior surface of ribs 3 through 5. So if we look at this, we see right here, here's the origin of the pectoralis minor, uh, ribs 3, 4, and 5, and then it's going to insert on the coracoid process of the scapula. And so remember, we're always pulling the bone or pulling the insertion toward the origin. And so if you kind of look at this, if you're pulling, if you're pulling that insertion toward the origin, that's going to tend to cause the scapula to move away from the midline. Okay? Then we also have the serratus anterior. These are going to originate on the anterior surface of more of the ribs, actually ribs one through nine. In fact, the reason this uh, muscle actually gets its name is because it has a serrated look whenever a person has low enough body fat percentage. You'll actually be able to see kind of uh, like the edges of a knife serration kind of below the axillary region. And that's because you have um, basically nine independent muscles right here, ribs one through nine. Okay. And each of these is going to essentially combine and insert on the ventral surface of the vertebral border of the scapula. So it's just going to insert on the scapula. And in the same way as the pectoralis minor, it's going to pull the insertion point toward the origin. And what that's going to do is it's going to pull the scapula away from the midline. Okay? And again, that's the process of scapular protraction. We won't be able to see very many muscles in this image, but here is the pectoralis minor. This is an anterior muscle, much like the pectoralis major. 
The pectoralis major essentially is going to lie superficial to the minor, so if you're just looking at an individual, you will not be able to see or palpate their pectoralis minor. But if we remove the pectoralis major, which remember facilitates shoulder flexion, which moves the humerus in front of the midline of the body, such as in a bench press or a punch, we'll be able to see the pectoralis minor. And what we see is that they do originate on ribs three, four, and five, and insert on the scapula. And like some of the other muscles that we've looked at, these muscles also run obliquely. They run at an angle. Now, because most of that angle is actually in the horizontal direction, just in the nature of the way they attach to the scapula, when they pull the insertion point on the scapula right here toward the origins on the ribs, they're gonna be pulling the scapula away from the midline of the body. So they're gonna be abducting or protracting the scapula. So moving this scapula right here, the right one, in the right direction or laterally, okay? And most of that is gonna be scapular protraction because of the nature that the angle is mostly in the horizontal direction. Now, um, one of the areas where, like I said, you would see scapular protraction is really any time you also have shoulder flexion. And shoulder flexion, remember, is any movement of the humerus that goes in the direction to put it in front of the frontal plane. So if you imagine throwing a punch in front of your body, um, that could be with one arm or the other, or sometimes both, if you wanted to, which would also be like a bench press, okay? The agonist of that motion is the pectoralis major. That's of the shoulder joint. But remember, this has to be accompanied by a scapular movement, and this particular one is scapular protraction. And so when you throw your arm in front of your body, the scapula move away from the midline. They move laterally, and so you're getting scapular protraction. Now, I mentioned that the serratus anterior is the more important of these two. Um, it's a little bit stronger. And for this reason, the serratus anterior is also known as the boxer's muscle because the serratus anterior has to be really strong to get that added force to move the scapula away from the midline, which actually is gonna allow you to um, punch with more force. And so for that reason, the serratus is known as the boxer's muscle. And as I mentioned before, if an individual has strong enough serratus anteriors on either side and a low enough body fat percentage, you can actually see a serrated look at some point beneath the axillary region, which means under the armpit. So that's scapular protraction. Let's talk about the opposing action, which is scapular retraction. Now, as the name suggests, scapular retraction is going to be movement of the scapula back toward the midline of the body, okay? This is generally produced when we have shoulder extension. And one of the ways we can produce shoulder extension is actually by doing a row like this. So I'll come back to this slide in a minute, but notice that if this guy pulls the barbell up toward his navel, his scapula are gonna be forced to move back toward the midline. And that's gonna be when you see scapular retraction. So again, back to this image. Um, going to the left here in terms of this little diagram right here, to the left would be towards the midline, so that's going to be scapular retraction. There's going to be several muscles here, some of which are more important than others. We see here the rhomboids. There's actually two of them. We'll mention that. The middle fibers of the trapezius, and then there's some contribution from the levator scapulae. The levator scapulae, which is right here, is going to be very minor because we're really only looking at forces that want to move this toward the left, toward the midline of the body. And you can see here the levator scapulae hits the scapula at an angle. It's mostly upwards, but it's going to have a little bit of force to the left, but not much, so it's very minor. The major two are going to be the trapezius middle fibers right here, not the upper fibers. Those produce elevation. The lower fibers of the trapezius produce depression, so it's only the middle fibers. They're going to tend to pull, at least on this side, the scapula over here toward the midline. Same thing would be on the other side, except the trapezius is a superficial muscle. And then the other ones are the rhomboids, of which there are two. The rhomboid minor, which actually sits more superior, and the rhomboid major, which is inferior to it and is larger. These two muscles, which are usually collectively called the rhomboids, are actually going to pull the scapula toward the midline. Now, in general, the trapezius, particularly the middle fibers, 
are going to actually originate on the vertebra themselves, okay, the spines of the vertebra. And they're going to actually insert on, yes, the clavicle, but also the scapula. And so the trapezius middle fibers are going to be pulling, at least on this side, they're going to pull this scapula, which is the left one, toward the midline. It would do the same on the right side, except they've removed that because it's a superficial muscle. We'll ignore the levator scapulae for now and talk about the rhomboids. We see that the rhomboids are going to originate also on uh, the vertebra. We can actually see here, here's the rhomboid minor. This one obviously is going to originate a little bit higher because it's the superior muscle. The rhomboid major is going to originate lower than that, but you see it's on the spines of these vertebra. And they're going to insert on the middle to lower vertebral border of the scapula. Okay. The rhomboid minor is going to insert on the middle part, whereas the rhomboid major is going to insert on the lower part of the scapula. But in any case, when they contract, they pull the insertion point toward the origin. So that pulls the scapula in this image to the left or toward the midline. If we look at the middle fibers of the trapezius, these tend to run more horizontally. So they're going to be originating on the upper parts of the thoracic vertebra, but they run horizontally towards the insertion on the scapula. So when the middle fibers of the trapezius pull on the scapula and pull it toward the origin, they're pulling towards the midline. And that's why the middle fibers of the trapezius are going to produce scapular retraction or adduction toward the midline. This muscle over here, or these two, are the rhomboids. The one on top is the smaller one. This is the rhomboid minor. The one on the bottom, the inferior muscle, is the rhomboid major, and we see that it's also larger. Both of these muscles, notice, run obliquely. So they're still going to originate on the vertebra of the spine, but they sort of run in a downwards, but also lateral direction toward the scapula. Now, obviously, the rhomboid minor, as you can see here, because it's superior, it's going to insert on a more superior aspect of the scapular spine, whereas the rhomboid major is going to insert on the more inferior part of the scapula. But in any case, because they run obliquely or at an angle, they're going to have motions in two directions. Most of that motion is going to be pulling the scapula toward the midline. So both of these muscles mainly facilitate scapular retraction or scapular adduction. But because there's a component of the force that's going to be moving upwards, there's a slight amount of scapular elevation that the rhomboids are involved in. Although because you can see that it's mostly horizontal, most of the movement produced by the rhomboids, major and minor, is going to be scapular retraction. All right. Now again, remember that the scapular retraction is going to be more associated with a different shoulder uh, movement, and that shoulder movement is going to be shoulder extension. One area where you would see shoulder extension is going to be a barbell row, like this guy's doing right here. And so his humerus is going to be moving in the direction behind that frontal plane. Okay, so it's going to be moving in the direction behind his body when he rows the barbell upward toward his navel. And the agonist of this motion, shoulder extension, at least in the barbell row, the major one is going to be the latissimus dorsi, the large V-shaped back muscle. Okay, and Whenever the latissimus dorsi pulls both humeruses behind the body or in that direction, that has to be accompanied by scapular retraction. And part of the reason that occurs is also to make way for the humerus so it doesn't crash into the scapula. If the scapula didn't move, then the humerus on that particular side might actually come in contact with the scapula. So it actually makes sense to kind of condense the scapula toward the midline of the body to kind of clear the way for the humerus on either side. And that scapular retraction, as we mentioned, is actually done mainly through rhomboids, and this should actually say the middle fibers of the trapezius, which we mentioned before. Okay, So, again, the major key with this is that you really have to have a scapular movement for every single shoulder movement. Okay, We're going to cover the shoulder movements in more detail in a few videos, but remember, for every single shoulder joint movement, we have a shoulder girdle movement. When we're talking about scapular protraction, that tends to accompany shoulder flexion, so like for a bench press or a punch. That's why the serratus anterior was the boxer's muscle. And then scapular retraction accompanies shoulder extension. 
okay? Uh, because mainly when you pull those humerus on either sides behind your body, you have to make way for them so that they don't crash into the scapula. So the scapula have to retract or adduct toward the midline of the body. Hopefully this makes sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.